Hi, Lisa. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this. This is, I always love chatting with other artists. <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. It's, it's always great to hear other perspectives and, and have art nerd talks. <laughs> it's the best. Um, so I, <clears throat> I have actually interviewed quite a few plein air painters and mm -hmm. I think you're the very first one to say you're a nomadic plein air painter. So first I wanted to ask you how you got started in plein air and then mm -hmm. how did it become nomadic plein air? Sure. Uh, so when I was four, <laughs> we're going way back. Um, I told my parents I wanted to be an artist when I grew up and bless their hearts, they sent me to art school. And I, I grew up in the uh, Hudson Valley, so I'm a Hudson Valley girl and mm -hmm. uh, lots of mountains. I grew up in the woods and the art school they sent me to had a big waterfall in the back and uh, it happened to be Chinese watercolor and the artist, the, the teacher would take us out to the waterfall and we would do these like energetic paintings of the water. Like how do you capture this, this moving object? So it just, it was something I always did. And then I, at some point I kind of got away from it. I got my BFA in metalsmithing. Like I went off on this other <laughs> tangent and, uh, and then, you know, got more into figurative art. And, and then I was at the New York Academy of Art getting my MFA. And um, there was a workshop in Tuscany to do plein air painting. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that one, one, one summer in between the two years. And uh, while I was there, I was, it just felt so right and comfortable. I was like, oh, this is what I grew up doing. Why did I ever stop? <laughs> so, so that just shifted everything. And, you know, the nomadic aspect of it, I, I always traveled for just always in my life. And um, uh, I have family all over the country. So we'd be visiting them. And, um, and uh, it, even whenever I'd start seeing these opportunities to go and study or paint anywhere, I would take them. And, uh, and then as my work became about climate change and I was going on residencies and going to these other places. It just, it all made sense to not just be painting in one location, especially as a plein air painter. And, uh, and then my, my life eventually went on a trajectory. I had this personal upheaval and, um, you know, I've been living in New York City for 12 years. And I was like, I don't, I don't need to be here. I don't need to be anywhere. So mm -hmm. I loaded up my cat, put everything in storage and just took off. I had a uh, a gallery in Newfoundland that was representing me and I knew that his house was free in the in the winters and I was like hey is your place free he's like yeah it's all yours till May I was like great and then and then it just like kept happening like I just I had residencies then people knew I was on the road and they're like well do, will you house it while I'm away or you know can you be my cat living cat nanny for a bit or you know like just all these opportunities kept presenting themselves so I was just I, I didn't live anywhere for three years that would have kept happening, <laughs> but then my, my little cat got sick and, and I got, oh. at the same time I got a job offer back in New York City. So uh, in, in January, February of 2020, I moved back to New York full time for now. Mm. And then the pandemic happened. And then the pandemic <laughs> <laughs> But I'm still a little nomadic. So I'm not even in New York yeah. right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. this, is, this is my friend's studio barn. I had some panels to sand and um, and any, any opportunity I have to not be in the city, I'll take. So I, so I came up here for the weekend to sand my panels and be on a horse farm and <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> seize the day. I feel like you're like the embodiment of seize the day. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes. You got to freaking just do it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I was wondering, um, your paintings are they have this mystical quality to them, like the ocean, and they're like, they have this fogginess, this, you know, there's like something, it makes you think, you know, beyond just the image, which I love. So I was wondering, because I have noticed in a lot of, of your Instagram posts, you'll, you know, write a very interesting description about these paintings. And a lot of those descriptions touch upon the human condition Mm -hmm. or they touch upon um, seeking something, something. So I wanted to know, um, when you're working on these paintings, what is it that you're seeking and how do you connect it to the human condition? So when I, when I started working, really focusing on landscape painting, I, I was thinking mm -hmm. about how you physically can be one place 
minutes, but your mind can be anywhere. And, and the landscape be a for for the, the, the human psyche. Just where, where are we daydreaming about? Where, where are we? And, uh, and that, that, would, that ended up bringing me to some very remote locations. That's where I first came to Newfoundland with a residency in 2010. And mm -hmm. uh, that same year, I happened to have an opportunity to go to Antarctica. And, and the thing is, you don't go to like Antarctica and not have a conversation about climate change. So that kind of seized my work for a bit. And I ended up in Greenland and the Maldives, traveling with other artists and making work documenting climate change. But as I'm making these pieces, I'm still thinking about the human condition because climate change, it's, it's a planet issue, but it's a human issue. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then I was going through that personal upheaval while I'm making these paintings about the disappearing shorelines of Long Island at that time. Oh <laughs> and it was all God. these ocean paintings. And because I spent a lot of time at sea and I go fishing off the coast of Long Island and, um, and uh, you know, so I'm making all these ocean paintings and I'm like, my life is like turned upside down. And, and, I, as, and the paintings are getting more and more tumultuous and the, the horizon line is disappearing. And, and I suddenly realized I'm like, these are not <laughs> paintings about climate change. They're about these are like portraits. <laughs> these are about people. And this is yes. about adversity and struggle and hopeful triumph in the face of adversity. Like you don't get much mm. more human than that. <laughs> like so yeah. even though they're about the, the sociopolitical of climate change, it, it really they're they're human stories. Yes, absolutely. And then I do want you to elaborate a bit more on how you see them as portraiture, though, mm. because I know you use a lot of very specific mark making. Um, you actually kind of like when I've, I've seen you like spray, um, I think mineral spirits or something on your piece, almost like pull it down. So I was wondering how you convey them, like, how are they to specifically like portraiture, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, so in, in two ways, one for sure, self portraiture. So, and it's, they're paintings of my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> because painting, but, but just not yeah. mine, because my feelings are not yeah. unique to me. No, ma no matter what brings mm -hmm. anybody to a feeling, we all feel things the same way. Yeah. And uh, like that's, that's like the biggest universal human connect connector right there. Um, and I, so, so as I'm going and processing whatever I may be going through in life, even good things, not all sad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well. It's happy feelings. And, yes. <laughs> uh I, th that will come through in the process so mm -hmm. you know yeah it's a painting of an ocean but uh it, it, it's just going back to my earlier work where it's the ocean in the mind and and yeah. everything is coming through in the marks and uh and and you mentioned the mineral spirits and so i, I spray with it whatever i can get my I, I, well everything with my paintings is whatever i can get my hands on so, <laughs> so it's usually water and it started because i used to leave my paintings accidentally as a plein air painter out in the rain <laughs> <laughs> it would just get rained on sometimes yeah. and but then I was like oh, I want to utilize this so I spray them with water or if it's not if the water itself isn't breaking down the surface as much I'll use mineral spirits um because I think that that destruction of the the of the surface gives room to put new life into it yeah. and and to be surprised and and uh you know just like have the unexpected within your work because that's again how we move through life is things just happen and react we, we react to them Mm -hmm. So, they're, so they're not the literal portrait in that, you know, I'm rendering like thinking of the anatomy, although I am thinking anatomy of waves, but yeah, or trees. I also paint, you know, other things in nature, <laughs> but uh, rocks. Um, yeah. But thinking of the, the, the underlying structure of these things, but then how, how they can break down. Um, and, you know, and I always say with my paintings, uh, you know, if you want to know how I'm doing, just look at the horizon line <laughs> of the work that's, that yeah. I'm generating at any moment. Because, uh, you know, horizon lines are really important for humans. It's, mm -hmm. you know, this is why we like being in high up places or out on the ocean. Because if we see the horizon, we know it's coming towards us. That's, yes. that's how we, we have, we feel like we have control over the absolutely unpredictable aspects mm -hmm. of life. Uh, but if you get rid of that horizon, then you have no idea. <laughs> and you're just yeah. in the fog. I rel I've learned to relish in that. And I, I think a lot of people do because there is something exciting. This is why people bungee jump and stuff like there's something excited about, you know, jumping into the abyss. Uh, yes. But yeah, if you, you know, and, and like, you know, even with seasickness on a very visceral level, you know, if it's, it's to overcome that you find a horizon line. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, where, where is it? What's happening with it? Is it eviscerated? Is it clear? Is it dense? Is there something that you have to overcome to get to the horizon? Yeah. And to me, those are those, those psychological portraits. I love that. Yeah. And it does make a lot of sense. You know, we have this primal instinct of you can see the threat if you can see the horizon. 
Mm. So if you don't see the horizon immediately, you don't know where the threat is. So exactly. it's shock. Yes. <laughs> and it's, it, I think you had also mentioned last time that you were teaching or you had taught a workshop on overcoming uh, when your life gets upended like that. And I feel like <laughs> you're definitely an expert, like not having, like not probably when you were in that um, nomadic time period of three years, you weren't living anywhere. I imagine being in your shoes and imagining like, I don't know where I'm going to be next month. You know, like yeah. maybe I'll be here. Maybe I'll be there. I don't know. Yeah. And it's, it's so, I'm a little bit stressed, but <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> like it yeah. feels stressful, but exciting. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot of planning, especially when you're dealing with going across countries and, mm -hmm. uh, and doing it with a cat. Um, Cause you know, she, so she, she was an old cat. So like making sure her needs were met, but also there's, she needs different certification and going to different places. Right. So, uh, it, so there's a lot of things to consider and whether I was driving or flying and where my stuff will be, what stuff I could bring. And then as a painter, just uh, any painter has the issue of flying with art supplies or, or how I'm traveling oh, yeah. with art supplies. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it, so there's a lot of, there were logistics to it, but frequently I'd be like, I'm not really sure where I'm going to be next week, but I have the next three days figured out. And, yeah. and in a pinch, I always had a tent and a sleeping bag in my car, which I think I only, I don't even know that I ever needed to, I think I always figured out a place to stay. I think it always worked out. Because the, the, the big thing about surviving anything in your life is being mm -hmm. vulnerable and receptive and asking for help. Yes. And if you're like, and this was, you mentioned that workshop, like it was how to thrive and how to survive and thrive when your world gets turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest thing to do is to have your network and nurture it so that it's there for you. So be a kind person, be helpful, be contributory, give more than you take, mm -hmm. all those things. <laughs> so yeah. that when you're in a moment of need, you can be like, oh, does anybody know blah, blah, blah. And people like to be part of a story. They like to help. Oh yeah, for sure. The, it gives me like Lord of the Rings vibes. <laughs> Like Sam and Frodo, like, oh trying to get to Mabu. Exactly. It was me, and, me and my cat philosopher. <laughs> Rest in peace. It's perfect. Yeah, go for it. Stay warm. I know it's freezing up there. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a very beautiful, it's like, you know, the hero's journey type of thing where mm -hmm. they just, you decide you go on this quest to go paint the world and then because of these friendships you've made and because other people resonate with your, your mission or your goal, or they want to be part of it, they help you. And that's, that's so beautiful. <laughs> I love but that's that. like, to me, that's also art. Like that's what yeah. art is. It's, it's, like I said, it's feeling it's, it's human connectivity. So mm -hmm. you have to live in a world where you're connected to it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, I love that. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, I needed to leave. Guess, who, guess who's getting a van? <laughs> yeah, off I've actually thought guys. about it. I thought about it. I'm like, because in the next few months, like I know I'm leaving the States soon. Um, and I'm like, okay, maybe when I'm out in Europe, I'm just going to get a camper van and I'm going to put all my painting stuff in there. I don't have a cat, but that's okay. <laughs> that makes it so much easier. I bet. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to go out there and paint and meet people and hopefully not get murdered. But <laughs> I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. So I always worry about these things. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I'm going to tell a little side story. Um, oh, I love this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> this is like unrelated <laughs> to anything except for just like, the, except for just being open in life and just, yeah. I, my life's motto, which makes sense with my work is, is just ride the wave. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. but the full motto, which <laughs> is totally related to my work is be yes. like an iceberg. Ride the current, see where it may take you, land in a cove, be beautiful, be glorious, be inspiring, and either stay there or, you know, lift off, go off to another cove, and then, you know, find a place you want to settle and then slowly melt to your ultimate demise. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> yes, I love this. But so, so, you know, just like kind of ride the wave. So one, one time when yeah. I was in Newfoundland, um, there was this big iceberg everybody was talking about. I was on the news. Like, they don't get icebergs in Newfoundland every year. They do. And, but it, this particular one was a photogenic one. It was on the news and everyone was mm. talking about it. So I was like, fine, I'm going to drive to Fairyland and I'm going to see this iceberg. And um, my Newfoundland friends are going to make fun of the way I said that town. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's still an American. Okay. 
<laughs> but so I was like, I'm going to go to Fairland. I'm going to find this burg. And as I'm going, I stopped at a Robin's to get some coffee. And this guy comes out after me and he's like, oh, you're from New York. And I'm like, huh? And I was like, oh, my license plate. I was like, yeah, yeah, I am. He's like, yeah, actually, I, I was FDNY. I lived in New York for 20 years. And he's a big Newfoundlander, so thick accent, big guy. And, uh, and we just start talking and chatting in this cold, rainy parking lot. And he's like, he's like, and, you know, I'm talking about an artist and where I'm going. And he's like, you have to meet my, you have to meet my uncle. He's an artist. You got to meet him. He's like, okay, okay, so this is what we're going to do. I'm not a murderer. <laughs> Oh, like, no. okay. And he's like, he's like, I'm going to get in the car with you. We're going to go to my cousin's. My uncle's going to be there. So I was like, all right. <laughs> like, I just went with it. So, so maybe oh, that wasn't the wisest, except that, I, you know, it's like, it's Newfoundland. I know the people. I know the culture. And, yeah. And it, was, it was my car. Like, he was getting into my car. So. That's scary. And also, he could call his uncle first. Anyway, so I'm still very dear friends with his family. Like, Aww. we ended up doing it. Like, yeah. And, like, we go hiking. We're still in touch with each other. And. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> oh, I love that. Still, I would also be like, good thing you told me you're not a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a funny thing. Thank like, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, and it doesn't escape me, you know. It's part of like um being a like a, a single woman, you know, on your own doing these things alone. It's terrifying in that sense also. Um yeah. cuz you don't know where you'll end up. But that's a <laughs> That's a different tangent. <laughs> let's, let's keep it happy. <laughs> but, That's true. Um, uh, you know, I, I talked with this person for about 15 minutes and, and heard his uncle. And I, I was like, I, I felt safe in this situation. Good. Good. I felt safe in it. That would have, yeah. It, sometimes I wonder, it's like, would they really try to rope me in with some elaborate thing? You know, like it would have to be extra elaborate for it to be not true. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it's like, you know, Occam's razor. The, the you know the most obvious answer is the right answer and yeah that's it that's all you can do <laughs> yeah 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 um... okay. ah yes murder <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh okay so um so I kind of want to circle back to uh, you mentioned that you did Chinese watercolor and I'm wondering because you did say uh, how it it's something that you know when you started doing plein air you're like oh I've been doing this forever um, but has the actual technique of Chinese watercolor affected or like um, I guess has it been brought into your current work as well? Yeah and it, it never left it's it 100% informs my work uh, and and multiple ways. Um, so a, a big part of what I, especially as I became older, obviously not when I was six years old taking these classes, but as I got older, my, my teacher had me read the Tao of Painting and, 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 and also the Tao Te Ching and, and she, you know, I had the Mustard Seed Garden. And so she had me read up and be very aware of all the mark making language around it and, uh, and the philosophies, which, which also greatly just inform my way I live. And mm -hmm. uh, so, so one of the many aspects is uh, the use of empty space in the work and allowing uh, the, the spontaneity and, you know, again, the unexpected qualities of, of nature um, to impart themselves and, and, and exist in the work and, and draw the viewer through on a path as they journey through the piece. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of my work does have empty space in it or just on, I, I can't say unpainted, but well, if they're on aluminum, it'll be unpainted, but on my canvas or paper pieces, it'll, it'll be parts that have very little paint on them, very little information uh, to allow the viewer to insert their own information within mm. that and go on there, choose their, choose their, their journey. Um, and uh, so th there's that aspect of it, uh, specifically to the watercolor, working with it transparently, uh, building up, working in many layers and building up to the final end point. So even though I work primarily in oil, that's still how I, I, I treat it like it's watercolor that mm -hmm. way. Uh, and um, let's think what other ones I could touch on <laughs> real quick. Yeah. Uh, so, well, yeah, I, th I think that's it, you know, just like really capturing the energy and the spontaneity and, and mm -hmm. throwing that into the work, but with, but leaving room, not like laboring over each point. Uh, oh, and then also coming up with the mark making vocabulary, have, having, right. okay, so 
do you have to be literal and paint every leaf or can you come up with a type of mark that generates the, the sense, the feel, the energy of that tree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the, the, yeah, the energy of it. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I remember last time we spoke, you also mentioned that in your plein air painting, sometimes you'll use grass, mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll use what, whatever's around you. So, and that brings it back to like it being a, a portrait also because it's a portrait of the landscape and you're literally using the landscape itself. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, when you're painting, well, I mean, when you're painting water, obviously you use water, but um, when you're painting in general, uh, like these types of like, like things where like you take the grass for the mark making also, when did that occur to you to do that? Yeah, the, so the, the rain was again an accident, like that, that just, was painting and there was rain and it's like oh this works um and so I, as i was thinking about capturing different elements of the landscape and thinking about like like i wanted to capture wind was what i was thinking i was like oh i was thinking of the elements i was like oh, well how do I, how do i do wind and i was on a residency um in upstate new york uh, called salt and stall and it was particularly windy there was these big storms that blew through and and the biggest obstacle to any plein air painter is, is wind really and mm -hmm. uh, like rain, you can deal with this, this thing, deal with the cold, but wind, it's, it's more complicated. And uh, so I just was observing these fields as I was walking around and just watching the wind whip the grass and the beautiful um, movement and dance that it had. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. what if I take my wet panels and stick them in the grass, let the grass make the painting? So that's, that's where it mm -hmm. began. And then I started, it, it evolved from there into many different uh, evolutions, but but I, th I thought it was really hilarious because you mentioned the portrait thing. And yeah. as I'm sitting there holding these wet panels in the grass and letting the grass make the painting, it made grass. <laughs> I was like, that's so cute. It just made, it, it made it a self-portrait. Itself. Yeah. <laughs> not all materials do, do that. <laughs> like that's leaves don't true. do that. Yeah, not everything no. does it, but grass totally did it. Uh, so then I started working, especially when I got back more involved with some environmentalism. Uh, I, I started meeting up with people who clear out invasive species. So I'd learn how to identify them mm -hmm. in environments and I'd pull them and then paint with them. Uh, and then, and as an incident of working with the plants, you get dirt in the paintings. I'm like, oh, well, paint is dirt. So that makes yeah. sense. And <laughs> last year I was on a residency in Colorado. It was very dry and the dirt is beautiful colors. And uh, I'd been doing it already because I was in Wyoming where there's all these beautiful colors of dirt like a couple years earlier. But mm -hmm. I just, I, I just really went nuts with it last year in, in Colorado. I was like, it's like I'm not. What do I even need paint for? So I just was like, <laughs> I mean, I was using the paint obviously, but I just would like yeah. put the paint on really thick on paper and then just like stick dirt on it, like let it dry and <laughs> like bake it in the sun, and then oh put more layers of dirt on, and then slowly like use some plants, put some like little textures in. I was like, great, there is the <laughs> landscape. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, and that reminds me of, um, I think I told you last time also about Van Gogh, how they looked at one of his paintings recently and there was a grasshopper stuck on one of his paintings. Yeah. Part of the story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's part of the mission. It's part of like that expedition into, you know, the, the landscape and painting it. Um, and speaking of expeditions, I did want to hear a little bit more about going to Antarctica and what it was like for you. How, like, did it change your perspective? about you know global warming and everything that's going on um well I, so I i grew up in a very environmental science family uh like we, we were the first people on our block to have recycling buckets <laughs> oh my gosh. and yeah <laughs> so um uh so that i was always that was always there uh mm -hmm. and, and in fact the way i got to go to antarctica was through um uh through through my dad actually he mm -hmm. he was a part of this organization that led uh expeditions for science teachers and because he was a science teacher and uh he, he's now retired but but so he's like yeah there's this expedition going down to antarctica for science teachers i'm gonna go do you want to come and i was and i had just gotten a grant so i was like yeah i can be a science teacher <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't go like that, but it was like all these, <laughs> all these teachers and then me. Um, yeah. So it wasn't an art residency, so I didn't go down there and paint. I, I took lots of photos and just observed because uh, mm -hmm. it also was pretty short, especially since we had some bad weather. So it cut the trip short. 
Uh, but it, it just, it, it did, because I, I wasn't even thinking about, because I just, I lived environment with environmental concern. I yeah. didn't portray it in my work necessarily. So it was the first time I started thinking about how, how can I tell these stories of climate change in my work? And, and as I mentioned, it, it started very documentarian with like, okay, I was in Antarctica. How do I capture the, the vulnerable, the vulnerability of this place? So I was painting these very delicate, only using white paint on aluminum, uh, very soft, delicate paintings that, if, depending on how the light angle was hitting the aluminum, would be completely obliterated because everything mm -hmm. becomes relative to whatever's the lightest, right? That's why we don't paint mm -hmm. on a white canvas. So if you have light hitting the aluminum, that suddenly becomes the whitest thing. So the white turns dark visually. Right. And uh, so, so, so I was just, I was exploring that. And then um, uh, an artist friend of mine, Zary Foreman, we used to show at the same gallery and she was like, she was playing this expedition to Greenland together with the specific interest in climate change and learning, learning how the, the environment had changed in 150 years from a prior arts-based expedition to Greenland where we went and mm -hmm. visited the same sites to learn how these places had changed. And in the process of doing that, and then, and then we also went to the Maldives and it was an ongoing collaborative project. But in the process of doing that, I learned that where, where you really can, it's more, you need to do more than document it. Mm -hmm. what I, when I really learned things was talking to people who are living it. So learning how it's affecting their lifestyle, way of life, culture, economy, uh, and then just their land and, and sharing those stories through paintings. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's also where that, that fed into the nomadic thing and made it easier for me to um, go nomadic because I uh, already had a sense of communicating with the, with the communities I'd be a guest in and mm -hmm. having a real curiosity and, and really finding out, and, and then also guided where I would end up. And, and a, the big mission for me going nomadic wasn't just like, oh, New York's hard and I just got to get out of here, which is a huge part of it. <laughs> But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but I selected the places specifically because I would learn about uh, an, an endangered plant or a vulnerable, something vulnerable in the landscape that was, that was soon to be lost or was lost or whatever. And, uh, and then would go in and speak with people about it and learn from them and then tr continue traveling around and sharing the stories of other places to other places and, and trying to create a, a dialogue about what's happening. And putting yeah. that human element into it, because we care about that, which we are aware and can have a face to. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, a lot of people, they are, you know, on par with like, yes, environmental, uh, well, climate change is a big deal, but it's very different when you know just about it versus mm -hmm. experiencing it. Like, you know, you talking to the people who actually live with this in the daily and they see the changes and it's affected their lives in significant ways. Um, I feel like here in the States, we don't really have too much of that uh, or like people aren't as uh, aware physically, like it doesn't directly affect them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting to get, you know, that perspective of you were already you know, in a, in a household that was very environmentally friendly to physically seeing it and getting that, wow, you know, this yeah. is like, I hope we're not screwed. <laughs> like I worry <laughs> for my children, my future children. I don't even have kids yet. I'm like, I'm scared for them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> the human kid, the, the hum humanity's children. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cause it's like, you think about your generations and then also like everyone else um, mm -hmm. and countries preparing already for the repercussions of if the, you know, sea level does rise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't actually get to talk to a lot of environmental artists like you. So it's, <laughs> um, it's interesting to get that perspective too. <laughs> so I appreciate it. <laughs> of course. I just want to say one thing on the, the kid thing. It's just a little tangential, but uh... yeah. I was traveling once with this, this woman who she was, she's whenever I'm, this, you, you meet gurus in life, like people who are just mm -hmm. like, wow, Ugh, they're just so inspiring. And she, she was one of them. And so whenever I'm stumped, I'm always like, what would she do? And, <laughs> uh, and, we, and we met on expedition on a boat in, in Labrador and uh, we, we ended up at the small community and, and she, she brought gifts with her wherever she went. So I also learned to be nomadic from people like her because I traveled mm -hmm. with gifts because I never knew who I was going to run into and who I need right. to thank. And so she was, she had like all these chocolate bars and stuff. And, you know, we went to this one community and nobody was there, but there in a community of like five people. 
and <laughs> nobody was there. And, uh, you know, she, I can't, she came back. I was like, oh, what do you think? She's like, oh, yeah. I saw that there was children that would have been living there. So I left this bag of candy. I was like, that's amazing. And she's, I was like, you're just such a good person. And she's like, she's like, well, when you don't have children of your own, you get to take care of the world and other people. Mm -hmm. And I was like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Like what a gift that is. It is. Yeah. And it is, um, uh, I don't know where I read it, but there are a lot of uh, quotes where, you know, humans are like the keepers of the earth. We're not you know, we're not just living in it, we're the keepers mm -hmm. of it and we're meant to care for it. So it's very beautiful that, you know, that's part of her mission too, where it's like, no, yeah. if, if you don't have anyone else aside from yourself, it's like give back to what's around you. And yeah. that also reminds me of another quote, where is the person who plants a tree, knowing they won't feel its shade, understands the meaning of life. Mm. So it's, it's like, mm. oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cherry on top. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, now I wanted to ask you about any upcoming shows that you have. So let's yeah, hear got, about that. I got a couple. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I have uh, the, the dates are, are still a little bit fluid, but they're, they're all later this year, like a, a, either mm -hmm. late spring or early fall or both um, or the summer and in the summer. <laughs> so, so I have a, a solo show coming up with Franklin Bowles Gallery. They're in Soho in, in New York City. Um, and uh, so making some work for that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then I have a new gallery. I'm working with Carol Corey Fine Art there in Kent, Connecticut. So I have a solo show with her, I think late August into September. Um, none of that work is, is, exists yet either. <laughs> so it's all brand new work. And <laughs> yeah. uh, although I, I have, I'm in a group show that opens next month with her. So assuming those paintings are still available, but they'll be in it. Uh, and that mm -hmm. show is specifically about... Um, uh, it, it, she has, um, some second market work from, uh, Birchfield and Marin who, um, are main art, historical main painters. And, um, mm -hmm. so she's working with artists who have painted the main coastline and, and I, I do a lot of work with Maine. So, so I'm in that group show. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I have the solo show with her later in the year. Uh, and then I have a show with, uh, my gallery in, in Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, well, Northeast Harbor, Maine. Uh, Artemis Gallery, and it's gonna be my. We, I, we thought this year was the ten year anniversary. It turns out it's the nine year. <laughs> so oh. it's my, ninth, my ninth show with them, um, and it's I'm a featured artist. They don't do solo nice. shows because it's a big space, so they do feature. So I'm one of the featured artists this year, and uh, and then they have a side show at a, a at a reputable boathouse. Um, so it's on mm. Northeast Harbor Rolls, and I think that's all I know about at this point. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> That's a lot. Oh my gosh. That's why I just love standing the panels. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> standing panels in preparation yeah. for these pieces that yeah. are for these shows. One. Yeah. Oh, cool. And it's aluminum, right? Yeah. This one, these are aluminum. Yeah. Honeycomb aluminum. Awesome. Honeycomb. Yes. So that, these are the Ar smaller. Archival. Ones they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they won't warp. That's for sure. And they're yeah. lightweight. Um, but yeah, I treat the surface so that they, they, they do become hopefully archival. You never know until things are around for a few hundred years and these have not been around that long. Aluminum is not yeah. as a material has not been around that long. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but oh I, I do everything I can. So working with lots yeah. of experts and, and input to, to prep the surface properly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, oh, working with materials these days, like with technology and I, I, I'm thankful of technology for this. You know, we've understood why past methods haven't worked why past mediums and past paints and past everything hasn't worked but now it's like we're trying out the new stuff so it's like we won't know until yeah. we know <laughs> like even acrylic paint i mean that's only been around for what like 60 years i think 60 I think, years something yeah. like that sounds right <laughs> like we think we know but until it's there we don't know <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, my favorite thing about acrylic, at least like on, on flat surfaces, you could just peel it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to clean. Yeah, it's easy to clean. To clean yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not a fan of acrylic, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's pleasing to be able to peel it off your palette. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yes. true. <laughs> Versus oil paint. Oh my God. Yeah, no, oil paint can be a little harder to clean if you leave it there for too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not my wood ones. Like eventually I just busting out the sander. <laughs> yeah, Some, it's just, mm, 
it's a mask actually <laughs> with a mask yeah I did hear actually this is a trick that I learned from from a teacher when I was in uh in the school in Florence um regular rubbing alcohol you just you spray it on it like it could be dead dry oil paint you put rubbing alcohol on the on it you leave it there for like 30 seconds to like a minute and then you get a scraper and it scrapes off like butter it's Ooh. insane <laughs> yeah this is entertaining and educational folks <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're learning all the tricks here actually it's because um he i at the moment i needed a new palette or like i needed a palette and i have one i just had like a, a glass one and he was like no you need you need a real palette i'm like no oh, glass one's still a palette um oh, like a he was like, let's oh, get you a wooden one i like the glass ones but um no i, I so do this... too although nomadic living it's it's a little hard to have a glass palette but uh, yeah, my studios are all glass <laughs> yeah my studio's yeah. all glass though but on the road oh, yeah they're, they're the road best road. Yeah. yeah, no. So there were these two pallets that a student had thrown out in the trash because they were leaving the country and they're like, I'm not going to like travel with these. It's too much. Yeah. Um, and they were just like, it was covered in paint. Like this person did not take care of these poor pallets. Um, and uh, he told me, he's like, oh, you just take this, you put rubbing alcohol, you scrape it, and then you repeat the process until you get to like the lower layer. And then anything that's like stained, you could just sand off. And I was like, okay. So I did it. <laughs> And now I have my palette. So I'm going to show you. I'm actually going to show you my palette. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of this palette. While, while you're getting it, I mean, like, so most of, I'm, I'm a total slob as an artist. It's funny when I teach because I'm always like, do as I say, not as I do, because I'm really uh -huh. lazy. Like, people joke yeah. with me when I'm painting with plants and stuff. They're like, you're just lazy. You're letting nature do all the work. And I'm like, so. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm also lazy. I have bad palette hygiene. But I kind of like having the old colors there at points because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, right. I can rematch that later because so you know I, yeah I, I work, like i'll work plein air and then take what i've and those are finished oh, yeah, pieces in and of themselves yeah yeah and they're finished pieces in and of themselves but then i'll take what i've learned and plein air and bring that into the studio and mm -hmm. so it's nice if i have still like this memory this like swatch of yeah. a memory of my palette oh that's sweet <laughs> yeah yeah um, it's like i remember that color <laughs> yeah it's like it's like you know what it's like i'm a, I'm, I'm a hoarder on my palette <laughs> love it so now we have my palette. Oh my gosh. It was completely like, you can't, you can see that it has a few patches, but it literally like came back and I'm like. Rubbing alcohol. I love you. Yeah, rubbing alcohol. And it's like. It's amazing. I mean, obviously <laughs> I get like, a, I like leaving a little bit of the, the paint on after I'm done when I'm cleaning it off. So it creates like layers of the, you know the color that i use so it it maintains like uh that mid-tone and it also covers those weird patches so yeah yeah rubbing oh. alcohol <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i can't wait i'm like i'm like my, my so wheels are playing with this yeah i can imagine you yeah. scraping paint now <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I've busted so many scrapers too. And as an environmentalist, I don't like doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. You're always living here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're just little waste producers. So it's like we can only, we, we, we try our best. We try our yes. Best. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You, can, you, you can't do it all, but you do all that you can. Yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Lisa. This was such a fun conversation. Yeah, thank you. This we laughed. Great. We <laughs> cried. <laughs> this is your broadcast from two artists in hats. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With bad hair day, so we're just wearing hats. <laughs> I love it. Like I had my oh mask my on earlier, so I was like, oh, am I going to have lines? It's oh, the, the lines. Thing, so. Yeah, no, you're good. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. You, yeah, and enjoy the rest of your 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 sanding of your panels and your aluminum and membership. Yes, get that muscle. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.